I have one of the most amazing ladies and she has had one of the most interesting lives of any Australian. So welcome to the show, Carol Chaney. Thank you so much. Look, darling, your life has just been absolutely amazing. You were actually born into a circus family. So would you like to tell us a little bit about that? My father's relatives had a circus called Worths many years ago in Australia. It started back in Germany where um, his ancestors came across because gold was discovered here. They were farmers in Germany. And there were so many gold prospectors that they decided that they would provide entertainment. So they became the wandering minstrels. And then from that, then there was a circus over the generations. And uh, it ended up with Worth Circus. So where were you based? I was in Dolby, which is on the Darling Downs in Queensland. So you didn't actually travel with the circus? Dad was offered to be the head honcho to put up tents and things, but Mum said no, we were too young for us to get properly schooled and travel with them. So, But from there, I desperately wanted to join the circus. I wanted to be a trapeze artist or be a back rider, and that's... I'd, on the farm, I would go down the back paddock with my horse and try to stand up on it and it didn't work. So that went by the by. And then um, I thought, well, ballet's pretty good. And, um, but there were no ballet teachers out on the farm. And Dad was a very good musician with the piano accordion and mouth organ. And Mum played violin. So they taught us to play music and we did concerts around the district. We, we were the, the concert, we were the, the, the comedy team, we were the song and dance man, we were the, you know, the band, everything, even to boiling peanuts and selling them at intervals. So we did oh, everything. Yes. So you did everything that happens on a circus exactly. anyway. Yes, but more down key, just for the local towns and things. Did you like that lifestyle? Like, did you enjoy it as a child? Oh, it must yes. have been exciting. Yes. Well, I think when I was probably 10, I saw the Bee Gees. They came to the nearest town. And I just looked at them and I thought, one day I want to be up there. That was my first memory. So I'd get in the back shed with a mirror and I'd sing into the mirror. The mirror was my microphone. Yeah, we did that until mum and dad separated. Can we just take it from there because the split with your parents, that yes. must have been a huge trauma for you guys. And how old were you at the time? I was 12. My sister was 14. And then I've got a younger brother and sister. Um, and mum wanted to wait till we were old enough to ask us what we wanted to do. Yes, it was quite traumatic, but you have to just go with the punches and just get on with life. So I started high school in a big city, or to me it was a big city. Um, which was Brisbane yes uh, and I never I, I would never I just couldn't fit in everyone had come up from their primary classes and you were now outsider so it was very hard um, mum couldn't afford a proper uniform we had a uniform but the shirt underneath she got from Lifeline or wherever and it was to be grey and so she dyed it grey but I was always so embarrassed because you could see the man's in the way the, the back of a man's shirt's made and I, I didn't stay at school that long in high school and got out and got a job and helped support the rest of the family uh, as my older sister had done as well. Mm. What was your first job? Like, was it in the entertainment field? Or? No, it was in a department store. Yes. And I was selling haberdashery and I, I learnt a very very um, important thing, how to break string with your finger. I thought that was very, that was very clever of me. That was my party trick because you had to wrap your materials in brown uh, paper and then you tied it with string and you, and that wasn't that long ago because I'm only very young. You yes, see, yes, so. I know. <laughs> Through your life, you've had some very diverse career opportunities and you've been able to talk yourself into positions that you weren't even qualified for, I believe. Uh, yes, a few, yeah. I just discovered it wasn't brain surgery, so nobody was going to die if I said I could use a switchboard, but I'd only ever seen one. And I thought if I get the job, I will learn very quickly or I just had to admit that I lied. But luckily, I've never had to admit that I lied. Um, so I was able to get through without too much hassle. 
So that, uh, that showmanship and that charisma really has served you well. You were born with that and it's carried you through life. Yes, well, my, my girlfriend's mother said to me once, if you apply for a job, never apply for exactly what you can do because you'll never advance. Always go that little step extra. And she stretched and that's, herself. That's been true all my life. So I've always <clears throat> excuse me, tried to go a little bit extra. So entertainment is, is genetic for you and it's in yes. your DNA. When did you get the opportunity to actually step back into performing as part of your career? Well, I still had my old sheet music from when we did the concerts and I was playing with a girl and I rolled the sheet music up, found this singing teacher and uh, went out one night, didn't tell anybody. When I first started, he was just transposing it into my key and I'd had a couple of sessions with him and he said, oh, there's a talent quest I, I think you should go and try out. So I went and tried out at this talent quest and uh, I didn't win, of course, but Luckily, a, a lady called Ellie Lavelle, who was a, an agent in Brisbane. So I know yeah. Ellie because she used to do a lot of the major promotions yes. for most of the touring shows. And so I met her when I was only 20. Incredible mm. lady. She booked me at Toowoomba. That was my first show. And on the way up, the band that took me up said, just be careful of the licensee. If she doesn't like you, she will tell you. So I had to go upstairs and get changed and come down and I never flew up those stairs so quickly. I didn't want to see her. I just thought, no, because <laughs> if she doesn't like me, I, get, I could cry very easily. So I thought, no. But she kept booking me back. So it was, I, I did the music that they wanted to hear, not complicated music music that the bands could play. And you had an opportunity then to tour mm -hmm. and you went up through Queensland, didn't yes. you, with a touring show? From doing the shows around Brisbane and the Gold Coast with Ellie, um, I was approached by an all-girl band and it was the first one in Australia and right. they needed a singer. Uh, Colleen Hewitt had just left and they said, uh, we'd like you to join our band. And I had a day job, plus I was singing at night. So what was the I name was of that group? Daughters of Zeus. Right. That was the all-girl band. So to join them, I had to leave my job, my day job. We got free accommodation in the hotel if we played Friday and Saturday nights. And so the manager promoted us. And um, we toured right up to Cairns and um, spent like a week or two in each town. And then I left them in Cairns and... On the way up, we met this other promoter from Sydney. So he said, when you get to Sydney, look me up, which I did. I moved to Sydney, looked him up and... Uh, was that the time that you were involved at King's Cross? Yes. It was around that time because you were actually involved in shows on the cross. Yes. They, well, You weren't stripping. I thought I probably should just mention that. Well, I did work in a sort of strip club as compared. It was very high class, I thought. Yes. Um, it was a, a little strip club called The Barrel, which yes. was lovely. And in the day, well, I did work with um, some notable musicians, being Tommy and Phil Emanuel. I was in a band with them and we worked at the Rex Hotel at the Cross. We also toured, we were in Brisbane playing at the Sunnybank Hotel. We went to Mount Isa and we played there and they were weeks it wasn't just a couple of nights, it was weeks you were there. So, you know, we lived in caravans and um, worked. On a Saturday night after the show, Phil and Tommy would want to go back to Sydney, which is where we were based. And so we'd hop in Phil's car and Phil loved rifles and snakes. So that was the introduction to the snake. Well, oh, hang on, I'm not, no, I think the snake oh, came we before. We had to do the snake. <laughs> Yeah, but I was sitting in the back of a car in the dark with a snake in a bag, feeling very at ease right. as you as you would. Uh, and then I would love that. We would drive home to Sydney and then drive back. But before all of that, when I wanted to get into entertainment, I don't know how how it started, but I started as a go-go dancer. Oh, I know how it started. I joined a sideshow. <laughs> you don't. I did it. 
You had to have done the side shows. Yeah, well, I was looking for a job and I saw this ad in the paper and it said dancer wanted and I thought, oh, I'll perfect be up. Perfect for me. Yeah, perfect for me. So I don't know how to dance, but, you know, perfect. So I, I rang up and they said they were a side show and they were leaving for Billa Wheeler from Brisbane. And over that afternoon, I rang and said, yes, I would join. Then I rang and said, no, I wouldn't. And after about the sixth call, they convinced me to meet them at Brisbane, go to Billa Wheelie. If I didn't like it, they would send me back. So he said he had all these dancers. When I joined them, he had one dancer, and that was the girl he was living with. And so, so the other dancer, that was you. <laughs> well, at the time, no. So I went to Billa Wheeler and I saw them working, and I thought, it's a lot of work for one person and I said look I could probably go go or something <laughs> and so they they set me up in this go go with the fishnet stockings and and here's after, a after, after, <laughs> I think a little bit later and after a couple of sherry's to settle my nerves I went out there I did go go dancing fantastic and while we're out the front if you know a sideshow they've got they spruik out the front yes and the guy that owned the sideshow had a snake and he would you know pull it out make it and I thought, if he could do that, why couldn't I incorporate that into a dance? So of course. So then I started to dance with a <laughs> As you do. As you do. It was just to help out, you know. It's like always do something just a bit more just than what extra. you think you can do. Mm -hmm. and it's amazing how much um, bravado you've got when you're in front of people with a snake. You know? yeah. <laughs> it does. Well, that's, they're all focused on the snakes. I know. <laughs> and in, if you the tent shows of those days, yes. they had little record players. But they would start my song and I'd be out in the side with my snake. And anyway, they, it didn't work. So I had to stand there for a little bit longer. And finally they put the song on and out I come, but I didn't know that the snake had wrapped its tail around <laughs> one of the poles and I'm there sort of pulling at it <laughs> stage. So they tell you never to work with children and I animals. Know. And never work with a, a guy that helps out and thinks he's being helpful by washing down a dirty, dusty snake before you pick it up. So you go out with all this mud and but no, it was it was lots of fun. That only lasted till Townsville then this other girl and I left and we uh, decided we could you know, do our own things. What was the next uh, exciting adventure for Carol Chaney after the snake? Well, sleeping at the side of the road, having a 20 cents worth of chips and a loaf of bread, and you were only allowed one sandwich mm. for lunch and one for dinner because that's all we could afford. So you actually left the show quite bright. Yes, we left at midnight, you know, snuck out, because um, mm. he used to drink a lot, and uh, mm. when he passed out, we left. So, um, so you yeah. escaped. Yeah, but we yeah. thought we'd get work, but it wasn't the, the high season, so we couldn't. We got back to Sydney. Um, I'm not really sure. I think there was a bartending job in there somewhere, and that didn't last all that well. So, uh, But I can pour a nice beer. A beautiful. If you like one. <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> no, I'm not a beer drinker. <laughs> I think that's when I found an agent, and they said, oh, would you like to go to Vietnam? Very few people have had the opportunity to perform for the troops. Yes. And that would have been a really special thing for you, like the, mm. the feeling that you would have had yes. would have had to have been incredible. Yeah, well, it, it yeah. was, you know, I mean, I'm a country girl, and yeah. I don't know about a lot of the stuff that goes on. I had no idea about the war. Um, mm. And so I just, they said, pack for six months, so I, I did. And um, we went over there and we signed contracts for three months with three one-month options. They put me with a male singer and a band and a girl dancer, so there was just the two of us girls. So you actually got to sing this time? You didn't oh, have yeah, to end I'm up singing. dancing? Oh, no, no, this is, I'm, I'm in a big time now, I'm singing, you know, so, uh, and I was the, the female singer. And, yes. um, the, the male singer for the first one, he was quite big in Sydney and with TV and all that. So I was again a little country girl finding a way. And um, no, you had to audition when you got over there and it depended on the audition for the, the American mm -hmm. forces as to how much the agency got for your performance and whether you were good enough to stay there. So we got through that and um, yes. the first time we stayed for four months and then I came home they put me with another group and I went back for another five months. That's, that's incredible. Five months. That's yes. a long time to be in Vietnam. Mm. 
Did you get to connect with the locals at all whilst you were there? We stayed in villas in Saigon and Da Nang yeah. because we travelled from way down in the Delta, if you know um, Vietnam, up as far as Da Nang and I think Way is just, that was the capital, it's just a bit north of Da Nang. Yeah. And uh, it, it was pretty horrid. I mean, we, when you were in the major towns or on a base, you'd you sort of got fed, but it wasn't good food. There was no fruit and fruit was very expensive if you went to the market. Uh, if you went to the base and you were doing a night show, you'd have fried chicken that had been reheated and the, the food was not. Mm -hmm. And you're an entertainer, you weren't a troop, you didn't. You, you'd sometimes get into the mess hall if you were staying on base. So they so did you, keep you separate to the troops? Oh, absolutely, yes. yes. Um, there's a, a whole lot of, that's another whole story of things that happened over there. Like, you know, you had outside latrines with the buckets and we had to use the men's toilet because the ladies over there was pretty terrible. And you might be sitting in there and they're coming to change the bucket. <laughs> so you want to go outside, but you just sit there for 20 minutes, you weren't going to go out until they left. Sounds it's like living in a motorhome now, doesn't it? <laughs> Pretty much. It's, it's a war zone. I mean, and, you know, they, they say, OK, you're doing this job, the, the truck will pick you up at whatever time. You'd hop in the back of these covered in trucks, as you see in the war shows, and you're bouncing around in the back, and next minute the, the, they'd stop and they'd come round. We said, what are you doing? They said, oh, we're putting on our flak jackets. And I said, well, where's ours? Oh, you don't get any. And then they take you up to a fire base. And that's where, you know, the guys are living underground. It's all muddy and the stage was a corrugated iron and you're out there. And you're right amongst the action. That was oh, the yes. thing with Vietnam. There, yes. was, there was no real safe place. No. You were right amongst it, weren't you? And at any yes. time, your life could have been in danger. Well, yeah, quite. Yeah. We were uh, in the last tour I did. We were in a, uh, an airport, a little airport, just for the, the troops, and we were waiting to fly to the next show, and there was big troop move movements, and they said, no, you, you can't get on, but you've got to wait at the airport. And it's nothing like our per airports, mm. it's a shed uh, with a runway. And um, right in the middle of the airfield, we didn't know there was some accommodation where they had the guys that stopped bombs from exploding. Yes, yes. And some of their guys had been sent home and we were there at night and they came over and said, look, instead of sitting here all night because there's no flights, why don't you come and stay in these bunkers with us? So we went over there, they took us to the mess hall um, and then we came back and that night there was a rocket attack and it had gone through the mess hall that we'd just eaten in and mm. killed the Vietnamese cook and some others and then they were rocketing the airfield and we were in the airfield, mm. in these hutches. So there would have been times like that, like many occasions where you actually did fear for your life and oh, wondered yes. whether you would come home? Well, you did, but you, you sort of didn't. It was, I guess if you're in a dangerous situation, you, you know there's things, but you also, you just go with the flow. It's, and you it's make an the unusual. most of that opportunity yes. anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was dangerous and, you know, if you're in, somewhere there could be Vietnamese out in the street with machine guns firing at each other and you're locked in a villa and you're thinking, you know, will they climb up over the fence, will they come in? I mean, mm. there was some pretty horrid stuff and if you walk down the street, sometimes the Vietnamese thought you were American and they'd throw rocks at you, so you had to get out of there pretty quickly. So it wasn't just mm. the war, it was the locals in some of the instances as well. So it was, um, yeah, an amazing time. And, mm. I, you know, I, when you work and live with somebody for four or five months, it's every minute of the day you're with mm. these people. So when you come home, you think there's nobody around because all your family's working. And that's when I went to the cross because one of the dancers said, you know, they're looking for uh, somebody to sit on the door. And I thought, I can do that. I can take their money as the punters come in. And then they had a, um, a very good playwright guy and he wrote plays for the local theatre restaurants. And he decided to write a play for this strip club and they needed a compare or someone to narrate the show, like from Adam and Eve to the year 2000. 
So I said, oh, I can do that. So that's what I did. He gave me the script, I learnt it, and I'd go out and I'd introduce this act, and of course they stripped, and then I'd go back out, and I had black suit on, you know, pants and fully covered. I, I thought it was such a nice way of being done. I said to Mum, why don't you come and have a look at the show? I don't know what she thought of the strippers, but I said, how did I go? <laughs> you know, so, but no, it, it, was, it was good. And then it, they wanted me to start telling bawdy jokes, and I'm not that sort of person. So. How long did you stay in that show? Uh, at least six months. I okay. mean, in those days, that was that, a long time. That's a fair commitment. It is, yeah. yeah. And where to after that? I did a show, a singing show, and they it was a huge show they bought from Sydney to Southport. So it was the first time I had my name in lights at a big hotel up there and they had various artists come up and I was the, the regular, you know, singer. And then I sort of lost my um, ability to go on stage. I just lost my confidence Is that completely. Mm. I never sang for years and years and years. And yeah, so I just went back to doing normal work. What do you think caused that? Do you think that it may have been like a delayed trauma from from your time in Vietnam? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, because actually there was, if your viewers know, there was a girl that was shot, a singer, a female, an Australian singer that was shot on stage. And it was just after that, that um, we were doing a show in one of the officers' clubs. And they came on stage and said, Carol, come on. And I said, I'm not finished. They said, no, come on, come on. But there was a guy in the audience who had a big bow and arrow and he was following me around on the stage. So they got him um, oh, and didn't yeah. tell me until afterwards um, because a lot of the guys over there really sad. They had Dear John letters, like, you know, the girlfriend's back home, the guy's over there fighting, he gets a Dear John letter. If you remind somebody of their girlfriend, you know, you just don't know. And... Some of the guys were, you know, like 16, 17 year old. And uh, you might do, we did a show one day and we got there early and we said, can we start? Because all the guys are sitting on the ground in their troops, all their, their gear, they were moving out. And we said, can we start now at 12? And they said, no, the show doesn't start till two. And at two o'clock, I went on with the, the others and we did the opening two numbers. The guy comes up and stops the show and said, time to move out. And those guys were ambushed, not far out of the base. So all those young faces that we're looking at was um, that was very sad. So you were actually given a huge award by the American Admiral, was it? Each group got a, a beautiful plaque, um, mm. but because there were seven in our group, you couldn't all take the plaque. I unfortunately, at the time, as you do, you don't think that you might need it afterwards. I didn't even take a photograph. Oh, um, but I did get a, uh, an award from them stating that I'd been over there. A lot of the Australian performers, there's the Little Paddies, the Cole Joys, they played to the Australians and I think they went over for a week and got looked after really well. Well, you guys didn't get the same adulation no, that, no. The, that the artists did that went over and just did a week and yes. came back and got all the, yes. the fanfare for that. Exactly, and yeah. you know, we'd follow Bob Hope, he'd be at this camp and we'd go, oh wow, that's pretty pretty big. Oh yeah, Bob Hope was here last week. Oh no, fair enough, you know, <laughs> we're here this week. <laughs> Come and have a look at us. Um, but no, it, it was very surreal and um, it's like anything, you, I tend to remember the good things, not the bad things. You eventually settled? Yeah, well, I settled. I had a budgie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my husband and I sort of got married, um, so sort of we were a bit older. We moved from Sydney to Coolangatta to, to Blackbutt, which is in Queensland, and the title of one of my songs that you wrote for me is A Million Stars at Blackbutt. Beautiful. Um, you did we, a great job of that we, song too. Thank you. We moved there and they had a little country music um, club and I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. I went to a couple of their shows but I just didn't have the courage and then my sister one day said, oh, let's just go in and see and there was only the guitarist there and my sister said, oh, Carol used to sing and he go, oh, come up, what do you know? So I gave him a song 
oh, that's great. And from there, it took so long. I was so nervous. My legs would shake and it was, they called me Shaking Carol because I just couldn't settle. And I thought, if I'm gonna do it, I have to persevere and, and do it. So I did, and now I don't get as nervous. That's quite a big thing to step mm. back onto stage mm. and, uh, and try to pick up where you left off. Mm. I was proving it more to myself than to anybody, and my husband David has been so supportive. I mean, without him, I can't do what I'm doing. So, and my family are behind me, and I, I couldn't ask for better than that. You and I had a chance meeting at the Texas that's Country right. Music Festival mm -hmm. and it was a really beautiful encounter and, and that's how you ended up coming to yes. record. And you have a really, a really unique style that it's very obvious that you come from a cabaret background mm -hmm. as, as far as performance but you still, you still deliver with that country edge in your voice. And so it's, a, it's quite a fascinating sound that you've created. Thank you. Well, it, without you, this whole thing with the CD, I mean, not in my wildest dreams would I have ever thought I would be doing this and the CD and Tamworth. It's, it's just blown me out of the water. You have found your niche as part of yes. the, the country music community mm -hmm. and you're certainly part of the LBS family. Your album is absolutely fantastic and it has not only had success in Australia, mm -hmm. you've had some pretty incredible things happen internationally for you with your songs too. I've managed to uh, get in contact with a guy from Ireland and I've sent him a couple of songs and now I have, a, I guess, a promoter over there um, he's taken the album and every month he promotes a song from that to the various radio stations. I've been nominated for the Red Carpet Award right. in Holland, which yes. is quite a big thing over there. So I only nominated one original that you wrote and a cover. Which song yeah. was that? What I Want. So Carol, thank you very much for being with us. It's been absolutely fantastic to share your life. And as I said at the start, it's been an incredible journey, hasn't it? Absolutely, and thank you so much. I mean, without you and Lindsay and Peggy, you know, this is not, would, just would not happen. Our pleasure, darling. We've had a lot of fun, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more fun into the future. Oh, there's a few more stories I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we might share some of the funny ones next time. Absolutely. <laughs> Good on you, darling. All the best, and thank you very much. Thank you. You're tuned into The Chazelie Show, produced by the LBS Music Group and recorded at LBS Musicland in Tamworth, Australia's country music capital. We thank today's sponsors, Oz Radio Gold, DLX Detailing and Shot by Lock Photography. There's a time in my life When hard would be easy We've known trouble and strife When we left our dad and we saw mom Hold her head up so high Up so high to survive To survive And it's hard to recall the days we went hungry but in time through it all the love of our family was so strong through the years to the end to the end we're alive we're alive yes we Yes, we made it through Even though we never thought we could Praise the Lord Praise the Lord 
reflect on it now and see we were lucky though we struggled somehow at least we were happy and our mum hid her pain from us all from us all though she cared yes she cared even now It seems strange when we're all successful and we've seen so much change. Yet still we are thankful to our mom and the Lord for the faith, yes, the faith that we share, yes, we share.